Good evening. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here, and I'm going to be asking of you tonight something that perhaps no one has ever asked of you before, and that is to take advertising seriously. We all know that the ads sell more than products, that they sell images, they sell values, goals, they sell concepts of who we are and who we should be. They teach us a lot about popularity and sexuality, about love and romance, about normalcy. They shape our attitudes, and our attitudes really shape our behavior. Now, my topic is the image of women in advertising, and I think we also all know that the image of women is negative. It doesn't take years of research to determine this. The first thing that the advertisers do is they surround us with the image of ideal female beauty. We learn from a very early age what this ideal is and to strive to emulate it and to feel ashamed and guilty if we fail. What is the ideal? If you close your eyes, I'm sure you could picture her. <laughs> the ideal is based, first of all, on absolute flawlessness. She has no lines or wrinkles. She certainly has no scars or blemishes. Indeed, she has no pores. <laughs> Now, the most important aspect of this, I think, is that it's an ideal that cannot exist. Nobody looks like this, including her. It's done via cosmetics, via camera angle, via airbrushing. It's based on a flawlessness that is inhuman. And it's also, of course, based on extremely conventional good looks and on extreme youth. And yet, this is the only standard of female beauty that there is in the culture. All beautiful women in all advertisements, regardless of product, regardless of audience, conform to this norm. Doesn't every woman want to be loved this much? And the message is clear that to be loved this much, we have to look like this. And once again, it's a look that can't be achieved. And yet we're told that our lovability and our desirability are contingent upon achieving it. In 1979, a film version of my lecture was made entitled Killing Us Softly. These images are still killing us softly, and by us I mean all of us, women, men, and children. I think we know by now that the image of women is primarily negative. However, just about everyone has the illusion of being personally exempt from the influence of advertising. So wherever I go, what I hear more than anything else is, well, I of course don't pay any attention to ads, I just tune them out, they don't have any effect on me. Advertising reflects a mythological world, a world in which, first of all, almost everyone is white, a world in which men outnumber women by two to one, and almost all the women are young and beautiful. The look is artificial, and it can only be achieved artificially, and this is a very important aspect of it for women. More than a million dollars is spent every hour in our country on cosmetics, every single hour. Now, there's nothing wrong with people wanting to look attractive, men or women, but there's something terribly wrong with the message to women. Because we are told that in order to be considered attractive, we must transform the way we look, we must disguise ourselves, that we will not do the way we are, that our beauty depends upon basically learning how to buy the right products. As a result, what happens is the woman becomes less and less human. She ends up with a face that's much more like a mask than like that of a real human being. Every part of the body has to be altered. Nothing will do the way it is. There's new improved fannies to consider, for example. The underlying message is you're ugly, you're disgusting, buy something. <laughs> As a result, what happens is the woman's body becomes hacked apart, dismembered in ads. So in ad after ad for all kinds of products, just one part of the body is focused upon. And this is, of course, the most dehumanizing thing you can do to somebody. Not only is she a thing, but just one part of that body is focused upon. Often it's hard to tell, as in this ad, who the real human being is. And this objectification has very serious consequences. It leads inevitably to actual physical violence against women. It makes sense in an awful kind of way. Turning a human being into a thing is almost always the first step toward justifying violence against that person. And this happens again and again. In 1979, I made my first film, Killing Us Softly, which is still shown throughout the world. And in 1987, I remade it as Still Killing Us Softly. Now, here we are at the beginning of the new millennium. 
I want to look at what I said in those earlier films and see what's changed and what's stayed the same. In the original Killing Us Softly, I said that I would be asking of you something that no one has ever asked before, and that is to take advertising seriously. These days, we do take advertising more seriously. Advertising has increased from a $20 billion a year to a $180 billion a year industry. The average American is exposed to over 3,000 ads every single day and will spend three years of his or her life watching television commercials, just the commercials. The ads, as you know, are everywhere. They're on radio, television, newspapers, magazines, billboards, bumper stickers. Here, one company brags about its ability to put advertising in your face all over the place. And at the same time, everyone in America still feels personally exempt from the influence of advertising. Computers can do many things. For starters, they can alter a photograph to make it perfect. According to this magazine cover, Michelle Pfeiffer needs absolutely nothing. Well, not quite according to the bill from the retouching company that describes all the work they had to do to make her acceptable for this cover, such as clean up complexion, soften eye lines, trim chin, remove necklines. In addition to retouching photographs of real women, computers can create women who do not exist. A Mirabella cover featured parts of different women's faces, one woman's lips, another's eyes, another's nose, combined to form the perfect face. Recently, a computer graphics company introduced a totally computer-generated model. Not a still image, but a moving image that looks like a real person. Soon, we won't need real models at all, and the ideal image will be more impossible than ever before. This wouldn't matter so much if it didn't connect with the core belief of American culture that such transformation is possible that we can look like this if we just try hard enough, buy the right products. If we're not beautiful or thin or rich or successful, it's because we're just not trying hard enough. And the research is clear that this ideal image does affect women's self-esteem, and it also influences how men feel about the real women they are with. Some of the original ads that I used years ago seem impossibly sexist and even quite hilarious these days. My boyfriend told me he loved me for my mind. I was never so insulted in my life. <laughs> She's built like all our products, heavy where she has to take the strain. <laughs> and yet, consider these current ads. A woman being used as a footrest to sell skateboards. It doesn't argue, it won't talk back, and it has no opinion. The perfect companion. Or imagine an ad like this targeting our young people. In so many ways, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Sometimes people say to me, you've been talking about this for 40 years. Have things gotten any better? And actually, I have to say, really, they've gotten worse. The biggest change is that I'm no longer alone, that there are now countless books and organizations, websites, films, other people who are working on these issues. Now, computers have been used to alter images for quite some time. Way back in 1989, Oprah Winfrey's head was put on Anne Margaret's body for a TV guide cover. Neither woman gave permission, by the way. Even the loveliest celebrities are transformed by computer. Kira Knightley, is given a bigger bust. Jessica Alba is made smaller. You almost never see a photograph of a woman considered beautiful that hasn't been photoshopped. As the media and advertising become global, the American image of ideal beauty is everywhere, transforming cultural differences. So the model in commercials and in ads throughout the world is young, thin, white, and usually blonde and blue-eyed, no matter what colors and shapes are the people looking on. Anne Becker's famous study found a sharp rise in eating disorders among young women in Fiji soon after the introduction of television to the culture. Our popular culture seems to have the ability to make women anywhere and everywhere feel absolutely terrible about themselves. Here is just an amazing ad. Now, 
when a big cake is more than you need, you need stir and frost. Now look at the top panel. Her problem is she's made too much cake. <laughs> too much cake, and they are all very unhappy with her. <laughs> Forgot about this. And if this doesn't say a woman's a piece of meat, I don't know what does. <laughs> the exciter. <laughs> this ad for Tabasco sauce that says, add your own dash at the table. If this ad isn't saying that this bottle of Tabasco sauce is having intercourse with this baked potato, I don't know what it is. <laughs> this ad ran in lots of women and teen magazines quite some time ago, but its message is sadly current. Your breasts may be too big, too saggy, too pert, too flat, too full, too far apart, too close together, too A cup, too lopsided, too jiggly, too pale, too padded, too pointy, too pendulous, or just too mosquito bites. But with depth styling products, at least you can have your hair the way you want it. And of course, according to this ad, there is no way to have acceptable breasts. And this ad ran quite some time ago in Vanity Fair and many other magazines, but at the time when this ad ran, it was so shocking that the ad itself got national media coverage. It's a good thing it got some coverage, I suppose. <laughs> Reporters called me up from all around the country and said, look, they're doing the same thing to men they've always done to women. Well, not quite. They'd be doing the same thing to men they've always done to women if there were copy with this ad that went like this. Your penis may be too small, too droopy, too limp, too lopsided, too narrow, too fat, too pale, too pointy, too blunt, or just two inches. <laughs> but at least you can have a great pair of jeans. <clears throat> it would never happen, nor should it. And believe me, this is not the kind of equality I'm fighting for. I don't want them to do this to men any more than to women, but I think we can learn something from these two ads, one of which did happen, one of which never would. And what they show us very vividly is that men and women inhabit very different worlds. Men basically don't live in a world in which their bodies are routinely scrutinized, criticized, and judged, whereas women and girls do. Advertisers always find ways to turn any movement for radical change into just another way to push a product. Some of the ads in my collection from years ago co-opted and trivialized the women's movement. Relax and enjoy the revolution. This is an ad for flavored douches. <laughs> so you're out to change the world, we can do it together. And this is an ad for shoe polish. Most notorious of all, of course, was the Virginia Slims campaign with the slogan, you've come a long way, baby. And what we learned is that women who smoke like men die like men. Feminism as individual self-expression is more likely to sell baubles and Botox than it is to do what we set out to do so many years ago, which is to change the world. So what can we do about all of this? Well, the first step is to become aware, to pay attention, and to recognize that this affects all of us. These are public health problems that I'm talking about. The obsession with thinness is a public health problem. The tyranny of the ideal image of beauty, violence against women, these are all public health problems that affect us all. And public health problems can only be solved by changing the environment. We need a lot of citizen activism, education, discussion, media literacy. We need to work together to change the norms and change the attitudes. People often ask me what gives me hope given how long I've been doing this and how little has changed. As I said before, I feel hopeful because I'm no longer alone. And I'm hopeful because there have been some signs of progress around the world. Some things have happened that I wouldn't have believed possible 30 or 40 years ago when I was first talking about this and trying to get people to take it seriously. In Madrid in 2006, the fashion industry said they would stop using models below a certain body mass index. Recently, Brigitta, Germany's most popular women's magazine announced that it's going to stop using professional models entirely in its pages and will only use real-life women instead. And very recently, politicians in the European Union have proposed a series of measures, including labeling digitally altered models, encouraging diverse and healthy body sizes in all models, and teaching media literacy in the schools. And it's important to encourage and support such steps. 
But we also need to find other ways to disrupt the stories that advertising tells us about ourselves and our relationships. Advertisers will never voluntarily change because it is profitable for them when we feel terrible about ourselves. So we must speak out, protest, speak up. This is not censorship. This is more free speech. Some groups have defaced ads in order to shock people into awareness. This was a billboard that said, expect everything, and it was changed to read, expect misogyny. <laughs> of course, I would never advocate such a thing, you understand. But most important is to get involved in whatever way moves us to change not just these ads, but these attitudes that run so deep in our culture and that affect each one of us so deeply, whether we're conscious of it or not. The changes have to be profound and global, and they'll depend upon an aware, active, and educated public, a public that thinks of itself primarily as citizens rather than primarily as consumers. It can be frightening to speak out, to stand up in this way, but as more and more people, men and women, find the courage to do this, the environment will change. And what's at stake for all of us, women and men, is our ability to have authentic and freely chosen lives. Thank you very much.